All right, good morning. I'm Jessica Berg. I'm the dean here at the law school, and it's my pleasure to welcome you today to the George A. Leet Symposium on Business Law. Before I get started, I just want to note for you, for those of you who are not getting enough CLE credits today, we have more stuff coming up. On October 6th, we have the Lewis Cass Scholarship Fund Conference on the Warren Commission 50 years later, contemporary legal and ethical issues related to the investigation of the assassination of John F. Kennedy. That will be, as I said, Thursday, October 6th in Tinkham Veal. That is another whole day conference um, for about six hours of CLE. And then on Friday, October 14th, we have the Arthur W. Fisk Lecture Series in honor of Fred Gray, making civil rights law from Rosa Parks to the 21st century. Um, also approved for four and a half hours of CLE credit. That will be on Friday the 14th here in the Moot Courtroom. Both of those more information you can find on our website. The symposium. So our symposium here was endowed in 1999 by a very generous gift from George Leet, a 1946 graduate of the law school and an active member of the Law Alumni Association. Mr. Leet held an interest in business law and spent almost his entire career at the National Labor Relations Board, ultimately holding the position of Senior Associate Executive Secretary. We greatly appreciate his, fam his and his family's generosity in creating this national forum on business law. My role is simply to say welcome and then turn our podium over to Jonathan Adler. He is the inaugural Verhey Memorial Professor of Law, the director of our Center for Business Law and Regulation, and a prolific author with seven books to his name, including, if you haven't seen it yet, sitting outside, the most recent, relevant to the topic of this symposium, Business and the Roberts Court, and a number of the authors of the chapters are also here. It should be a fantastic conference. I'm glad you're here to join us and enjoy. Thank you, Jessica. Um, I'm going to be very brief because you'll hear more from me in a moment. And um, uh, but first, want to thank you for coming. Uh, Want to say just a little bit about uh, the inspiration for the program. Um, since shortly after the Center for Business Law and Regulations founding, uh, we decided that uh, it would be useful to uh, do a series of programs that look at business law in the Supreme Court, uh, in part because. Uh, we believe it's an important part of what the Supreme Court does as a practical matter. Uh, decisions involving questions relating to business law, whether it's preemption, class actions, jurisdiction, and so on, often have uh, a more significant practical effect than some of the decisions that may make uh, the evening news or the front page of the newspaper. And also that, that there's often a lot more going on in these areas than is captured in uh, uh, policy discussions about uh, the law and what the court is and is not doing. So we've done programs focusing on specific cases. For example, we did a program uh, on the Stone Ridge Investment Partners case, uh, previewing both the legal and policy aspects of that case before it was argued. Uh, we did a, uh, a research roundtable colloquium uh, at which several of the papers that became chapters in the Business and the Roberts Court book were first uh, first prepared and presented. And, and then of course today's program that uh, builds on some of the same themes in the book, but features a lot of pe uh, people with uh, differing perspectives from those in the book, looking at the question of how does the Supreme Court approach these sorts of issues? What are the sorts of doctrinal and other commitments that the justices bring to these issues? Uh, and how should we understand their, their work in this area? Uh, and so that's kind of the idea behind this conference and the other work we do in this area. And hopefully uh, you'll find it to be as interesting as, as we do. Um, but again, thank you for coming. And I'm gonna turn it over to, to Dean Enton, who I think is just gonna turn around and introduce me uh, right back. But uh, he's moderating the first panel, so, so I, I'm gonna turn it over to him. Thank you, Jonathan. Um, since I don't have anything substantive to say, I'm going to say here. Um, uh, for our uh, our opening uh, session is basically designed to set the, the framework for where we're going to go uh, with the rest of the day. Um, and we have four folks uh, who bring uh, different sorts of experiences as well as perspectives uh, to the question of what does it mean to say that, that a court is pro-business. Um, as Jonathan said, uh, he is actually the first speaker on this session. Uh, since he's already been introduced once, um, I, don't, uh, I don't think that, that I will uh, say much more other than that he and I spend a fair amount of time disagreeing with each other uh, about things, and that's actually one of the nice things about being in academic life. Um, Jonathan will be followed by uh, James Copeland, who is the Director of Legal Policy at the uh, 
at the Manhattan Institute. Um, and uh, he will be talking about what it means to be pro-business uh, from a uh, variety uh, of, uh, of uh, legal and, and analytical perspectives. Uh, and uh, Jim is at the far end uh, here. Uh, our third speaker, uh, right next to, uh, or between Jonathan and Jim, is uh, Mitchell Pickerel. Uh, Mitch is a lawyer. Uh, uh, and he is now uh, a professor of political science uh, these days at Northern Illinois University, but he has uh, he, he previously taught at Washington State. Um, and uh, so Mitch is going to uh, bring a kind of <coughs> interdisciplinary uh, take, uh, one that he himself exemplifies, uh, but he'll be tr presenting uh, some analytical perspectives uh, from different uh, approaches to judicial politics uh, in the political science literature. And, and our last speaker uh, is Karen Harnett. Uh, she is also a lawyer uh, and is executive director of the National Federation of Independent Business, which, as many of you will recall, uh, was the lead challenger to the constitutionality of the Affordable Care Act uh, several years back. Um, and and uh, Karen will also be bringing a kind of small business perspective to the question of what does it mean to say that we have a pro-business court. Um, each of our speakers will talk for maybe 10, 12 minutes, something on that order. Uh, we'll get, try, we've got plenty of time for discussion. We'll try to get the, the uh, panelists maybe to, to uh, uh, respond uh, as appropriate, uh, but we want to get as much discussion from the audience as possible uh, as well. So uh, with that, uh, let me turn things over to Jonathan and go from there. So thank you, Jonathan, and, and thank you all again for being here. What I, what I want to do um, uh, in these remarks is to say a little bit about what it means to ask the question about whether or not the Roberts Court is, is pro-business and some ways we might want to think about that and some ways we might not want to think about it if we want to actually understand what the court is doing and uh, certainly for those of you that, that are in practice to perhaps have some insight into what the court might be doing in the future because certainly that can be important in terms of um, uh, the interest that, that various clients uh, may have. It's an important question, I think, because the Roberts Court pretty much from the outset was labeled as a pro-business court. Um, uh, it was The Roberts Court had been sitting really for only about a year or so bef before prominent commentators uh, including academics, started saying that the court seems to be particularly pro-business. And, and often some of the early decisions of the Roberts Court were pointed as evidence. Uh, the first several preemption cases, for example, that the court heard were all decided in, in favor of preemption urged by uh, corporate, de, uh, corporate uh, uh, interests. Uh, the first uh, six or seven antitrust decisions of the Roberts Court were all decided in favor of uh, corporate defendants uh, in those cases. Um, the court uh, uh, was declared in, in 2008 by a, a, an article by Jeff Rosen in the New York Times Magazine to be Supreme Court Inc. And, and the question was asked, uh, is the business of the Roberts Court uh, business? Um, and I, I think though, the reason we wanna unpack what, what it means to say the court is pro-business is because, for, well, for a couple of reasons, one is, if we want to make a normative judgment, do we like what the court is doing? Do we think the court is moving in a direction that is positive or negative, it's favorable or unfavorable, perhaps even if we think it's relevant to evaluating presidential candidates or what have you, uh, we should under try and make sure we have a good descriptive account of what the court is actually doing. And I will confess one of my biases, I don't think that uh, simple labels like conservative, liberal, pro-business, pro-defendant, pro, -business, pro consumer, pro-environment, anti-environment, and so on, tend to really capture uh, uh, much of what a, an entity like the Supreme Court is doing. I also think we want to uh, unpack what it means because we want to understand the texture of uh, what the court's jurisprudence looks like. Unless we think that the court has an invariable disposition uh, towards a particular set of interests or a particular set of outcomes, the simple label doesn't get us very far. 
Uh, it doesn't explain, for example, why uh, the court might find in a way or decide one type of case uh, in favor uh, of uh, of corporate interest in another case not. It won't tell us, for example, why the court might think that um, tort claims against medical device manufacturers are preempted by uh, by the FDA in a case like Regal versus Medtronic, but then shortly thereafter decide that failure to warn claims against pharmaceutical makers are, are not preempted uh, by, by the FDA. We need to think more closely about what the court is doing. I think one analogy to help us uh, th think about uh, how how to evaluate whether the court is pro-business is, is to, to think about um, Justice Scalia and the criminal law. And I use use this as an example because since Justice Scalia's death, there's been a lot of conversation about uh, his jurisprudence and his legacy. Um, on the one hand, Justice Scalia clearly was a conservative jurist. And we might assume that that would mean that as a conservative, he's more likely to be skeptical of claims by criminal defendants, sympathetic to claims by prosecutors and police, and in general, in, general, uh, in close cases, more likely to side with uh, the state in criminal law matters. And certainly, uh, Justice Scalia was skeptical of the exclusionary rule. He was uh, adopted a more permissive attitude to potential misconduct by the police and by prosecutors, um, uh, was not particularly sympathetic to habeas claims uh, brought uh, in, in federal court, particularly those uh, raising claims about ineffective assistance of counsel. And in those r run of cases, we would tend to find where the court divided he would tend to vote uh, with um, uh, with the state, uh, with prosecutors, and with the police. But at the same time, we know in looking at his jurisprudence that when it came to questions of enumerated rights for criminal defendants, the confrontation clause, the jury right, uh, and the like, uh, he was a rigid formalist and arguably the most pro-criminal defendant justice on the bench. Uh, he would uh, regularly vote uh, to argue that minor uh, infringements or on uh, the confrontation right of criminal defendants, minor infringements on the jury trial right, for example, in findings made by judges and defendants, uh, were not permissible because the language of the Constitution uh, did not uh, allow for such deviations, also adopted a fairly rigid definition of what constituted a search, having no difficulty uh, applying the idea of a sur uh, of, of what constituted a search to modern technologies. And so if we look at those cases, we would say, well, wait a second. He's, um, he's, he's very pro-criminal defendant. He's very anti-state in criminal law. And of course, the real, real answer is it, it depends, that his doctrinal commitments were such that in some types of criminal law cases, we could expect him to be quite hostile to criminal defendants, and in other cases, quite favorable. But if we simply were to add up the criminal law cases and just tally his votes and to use that to decide is he pro-criminal defendant or anti-criminal defendant, the answer we get would be a function of the court's docket. It'd be, a, it'd be a result of, well, are there more cases involving the application of enumerated rights in, in the Bill of Rights or more cases involving uh, questions about what's reasonable conduct or, or whether or not the exclusionary rule needs to apply. Um, it wouldn't really be illuminate, particularly illuminating in terms of uh, de trying to evaluate what the likelihood of Justice Scalia's vote would be in a particular criminal law case. It uh, wouldn't really tell us very much about what lower courts uh, are, are expect, should be expected to do or how the Supreme Court would uh, decide uh, future cases. And I think we could say the same thing about the Roberts Court and, and business, that when we simply tally up uh, cases, uh, we lose a lot of the texture of what's going on in those cases. We don't actually get an accurate picture of what is going on, and we don't get much of predictive value in trying to say, well, if we're trying to figure out uh, what the Supreme Court is likely to do, or we are trying to give guidance to a lower court or make an argument in a lower court, simply saying, well, the Chamber of Commerce or NFIB uh, won X number of cases in which they participated um, doesn't uh, tell us uh, very much. Uh, and it's even more complicated if we look at merely who participates, because when you talk about the participation of, say, the Chamber of Commerce as a proxy for business interests, or again, or NFIB, or some other business group, uh, you have the confounding factor of having a repeat player uh, in the case of the business groups that, that are involved in Supreme Court litigation, uh, and particularly in filing amicus briefs, a repeat player that's quite sophisticated, 
and that I think it's fair to say, and, and, and you know, Karen may, may correct me if she doesn't think this is the case with NFIB, but certainly in the case of the Chamber of Commerce, is somewhat strategic. Uh, uh, filing amicus briefs in cases where uh, the chamber thinks it has something to add, uh, and in some cases, notably not filing case, uh, briefs in cases that may be of very large importance to the business community, but where the Chamber of Commerce, for example, doesn't believe it has much chance of influencing the outcome of the court um, or preventing an outcome that they don't like. I think it's also important in thinking about this question of whether the court is pro-business in thinking about what we mean in terms of substantive outcomes. Um, do we simply mean that, are we simply making a judgment about a, a predisposition of the court or of certain justices toward particular parties? Uh, or are we saying a commitment to certain types of outcomes? Uh, and that makes a difference. Um, similarly, are we talking about, uh, uh, in terms of uh, doctrines that the court may embrace, that are beneficial to business? Uh, are we talking about doctrines that largely maintain the status quo, uh, protect investment-backed expectations against innovations in the law that might be threatening to business? So for example, closing off new avenues that are developed by plaintiff's lawyers to open new ways of challenging corporate conduct? Or are we talking about shifting the law in a, in a pro-business direction and perhaps even entrenching legal doctrines that are favorable to business and constitutional doctrine. So for example, there's a difference between a court saying, we don't think this type of, uh, uh, this theory of, of a class action suit or this theory of, uh, of a derivative suit is authorized under current statute. If Congress wants to authorize them, they have to do it, not the job of the judiciary. That's a very meaningfully different type of decision than say, for example, the decisions in the Rehnquist court that held that the due process clause imposed constitutional limits on the extent of punitive damages that may be awarded in tort litigation. Not only is that is that uh, a, a different type of decision because of it is a change in the law rather than the maintenance of the status quo, it's also meaningfully different because it entrenches a rule, right? By declaring that 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 a particular doctrinal outcome is not merely based on the reading of a statute, but is compelled by the Constitution, the ability of Congress or the other political branches to alter that baseline uh, and to and to and to over, overturn or to challenge what the Supreme Court did it is much more constrained. And so uh, we want to think about in evaluating whether the Supreme Court is has been acting in a pro-business way. What the way in which it may have been acting in a pro-business way, whether it has been uh, acting as a shield to business interests, deflecting challenges uh, to corporate conduct, or operating as a sword, affirmatively striking down things that um, uh, th that that business may get in the way of. And certainly, uh, the book that that Jonathan mentioned that that uh, is available outside at a discount, and there are flyers with a discount code if people want it. Um, uh, Quick plug, I had to do that. Uh, it tries to unpack these questions. And mo most of the chapters in the book, uh, I would just note, are, are, sub are, are subject area specific examinations of trying to make sense mm -hmm. of what the court has done in uh, particular areas. Because uh, as I suggested, that I think that kind of analysis is, is a necessary part of understanding what, what the court has done in this area. Um, really briefly, let me say a little bit about um, uh, to, or me, say two other things about, about, what, about the, what we can say of the court in this area. Uh, one is I do think it is indisputable that um, the court over the last 10 years, since uh, John Roberts has been Chief Justice, uh, has taken an increased interest in issues that are uh, significant to the business community and that we might characterize as business cases. Different people characterize cases as business cases differently. Uh, some just look at, you know, what is the specific law at issue? Some try and evaluate it based on um, uh, the effects. So, um, you know, is a case, uh, uh, is a case, for example, like Iqbal, Ashcroft versus Iqbal, which technically is not about business law at all, but is actually about pleading standards. Is that a business case? Is that a not, not business case? Different people tabulate them different ways. But I think all the various folks that have looked at the share of cases that matter to business as a percentage of the docket have found that it has increased uh, as, as a percentage of the court's docket. And this is notable, not just in itself, 
but particularly notable given that the docket of the Supreme Court has shrunk so much, right? The court hears 70 cases a year now. Uh, 20, 30 years ago, it would hear uh, double that number each year. Uh, the court, uh, as currently constituted, uh, takes a very narrow view of what constitutes a cert-worthy case. Uh, the court is very uninterested in taking cases merely because they are big issues and interesting. Um, they really want to see cases that, uh, that that they feel they are required to take because that are that where Supreme Court intervention is necessary because of a a split in the circuits um, or a, a a significant challenge to a, to a federal law, and where the court's intervention to ensure consistency and uniformity is particularly required. Um, one consequence of this is that the cert practice, the practice of filing petitions for certiorari is uh, in, of increasing significance. And as, uh, uh, as some scholars have noted, including Richard Lazarus, who has a chapter on this in the book, um, the increased sophistication of the, and professionalization of the Supreme Court bar and the utilization of the Supreme Court bar by the business community in particular appears to be having a significant impact on the range of cases that the court takes. Um, the, 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 the attorneys that argue uh, uh, Supreme Court cases, but even more importantly, the attorneys that file uh, petitions of certiorari that are granted uh, are becoming increasingly concentrated. Um, uh, if you have a case that you want to go to the Supreme Court, uh, and no one's paying me to say this, uh, it really does uh, uh, benefit you to have assistance in the certiorari process with uh, of one of the firms that that really has a specialized professionalized practice. They know what the justices want to see in a petition for certiorari. They know perhaps just as much uh, what the clerks want to see, and perhaps somewhat distressingly, there there's at least one study that suggests that clerks are are kind of well aware of who the celebrity uh, Supreme Court attorneys are on the Supreme Court bar and appear to pay more attention to briefs that have those names on them. Uh, and so if getting a, a more attention to a, a petition for certiorari matters, um, then being aware of this dynamic uh, is certainly uh, important. And there's no question that the business community uh, has been aware of this uh, and has increasingly invested in um, get, having uh, petitions for certiorari filed by uh, members of uh, the Supreme Court bar, and it appears to have an effect. I think one other factor that may have an effect here is also the, the internal process that the court uses for uh, granting um, uh, petitions for, cert for certiorari. All of the justices but one uh, participate in a, a certiorari pool. So they pool their clerks and they uh, evaluate uh, the petitions uh, kind of collectively. Uh, a single memo will be produced for eight of the nine justices um, on, on most petitions for certiorari. Um, only one justice doesn't participate. That means that you really get fewer eyes uh, on, um, uh, on, on a, a given petition, and it's less likely that you have you will have someone that uh, says, wait a second, there's something here that uh, is worth a second look. It's also been reported um, that, um, uh, especially at the beginning of the term and during the long conference where the court uh, looks at the lion's share of petitions for certiorari at the end of the summer, uh, the clerks are new and that there is substantial institutional pressure not to seem too eager to grant petitions. Um, so many uh, former clerks report that, that you know, it, it, it's, it's, it's impressed upon them that, that it's better to err on the side of saying deny than to say grant. Uh, and if, if, if fewer uh, 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 folks are looking at cases combined with that institutional pressure, it becomes that much more important to know how to pitch a, a brief to the court, to the justices, and to the clerks um, uh, to make a case uh, that the case should be granted. And insofar as there might be an imbalance, that is to say insofar as um, a large corporate clients, business groups and the like have more resources to devote to uh, this practice. We would expect that to have uh, some effect on the court's docket. There, now, there certainly are groups, um, uh, uh, Georgetown uh, uh, as, as an institute that, 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 that provides some assistance, groups like Public Citizen and, and the like uh, seek to provide assistance uh, to consumer groups and nonprofits and to others. Um, and uh, uh, certainly that helps, but if one believes there is a resource imbalance, we, we, there certainly are good reasons why we would think that affects um, the, the range of cases that, um, 
uh, the court takes. Um, last um, uh, uh, point I want to make um, on empirical uh, uh, studies, um, because I think some of the, the quantitative studies, one other caution about empirical studies, especially over time, I want to think about too is that there is in a quantitative assessment of the court, uh, one concern thing that we, we always have to be concerned about in looking at the court is uh, the baseline, what I characterize as the baseline problem. The idea that um, looking at wins and losses um, or, and adding them up can often obscure changes in the law that are very important. I'll give one example um, that's an area that I've written a lot about, which is in the environment. Uh, and just look at the Roberts Court and its handling of climate change cases, cases that are clearly of very a large importance uh, to the business community, very important to uh, the energy sector, um, uh, to industrial corporations that, that have um, uh, boilers and coal-fired plants and the like. Uh, the Supreme Court thus far has considered three climate change cases, Massachusetts versus EPA, American Electric Power versus Connecticut, and UARG versus EPA. Uh, business community clearly lost one, Mass versus EPA clearly won one of those cases, AEP, and one case I think is best characterized as a draw. The business community won some parts of what it wanted uh, and lost others. Uh, if we look at um, uh, those and, and it tabulate them that way, it says, well, business has, has held its own. One win, a loss, and a tie. Um, even if we think maybe the business won more than it's lost in the third case. In UARG, you could say business won two cases and lost one. A quantitative assessment says, aha, the Supreme Court's been pro-business in climate change cases. But here's the rub. Uh, Massachusetts versus EPA, the case that the Supreme Court lost and lost five to four, is orders of magnitude more significant than the other two cases. The state of the law today that it is easier to, to have standing to bring climate change related cases, that the EPA has expansive authority to regulate greenhouse gas, gases as a pollutant is far more pro-regulatory, far more, I guess you could say anti-business if you think pro-regulatory correlates with anti-business than what the status quo had been before these three cases were decided. So even if one thinks this, the, the business community has won more cases than it's lost, the state of the law for utilities, for the coal industry, for the, the, most of the industries that care about these cases, is substantially more negative than before these three cases were argued. Uh, and so when we think about quantitative cases, we have to think about not merely what are the numbers of wins and losses, but how the actual legal rules themselves have changed. So an, another example would be if we're looking at implied causes of action, uh, if, we have, if we want to compare a court where that is viewing implied causes of action very stingily, and we're going to compare that to a court that was deciding cases when such causes of action weren't recognized at all, that needs to inform our analysis beyond when we decide to count up the wins and losses. Uh, of course, deciding whether or not it's pro-business is a separate question from our normative judgment. Right? To say it, uh, the court is being pro-business or anti-business is not necessarily to say it's good or bad. There again, I think we want to look at the substance and texture of what the court's doing. If we want to get a sense of, well, is whatever the court's doing in this area something that we like or that we don't like? And I think uh, additional speakers today will, will help shed light on how we might want to think about uh, whether these are good or bad developments. Thank you. Well, I'd like to, I'm, I'm Jim Copeland. I'd like to thank Professor Adler for inviting me here. Uh, I guess I've, this is, it's been eight years, I think, since I, I was here, and that was talking about that Stone Ridge case. Um, I'm not, I, I direct the legal policy efforts of the Manhattan Institute where I'm a senior fellow. I'm not a constitutional law Supreme Court scholar, uh, and some of my think tank colleagues in DC at Heritage and Cato and other similar organizations uh, follow the Supreme Court more closely than I do. But what I do do is, is sort of follow the business law trends, the law and economics. I look uh, a lot at civil litigation, corporate criminal liability, corporate governance, and these sorts of questions. Uh, so I do take a significant interest in that, and I think that's why Professor Adler sort of asked me to join you today. And I want to uh, sort of amplify and 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 shed some some additional light on on the sorts of things that Professor Adler was talking about in his remarks. At, at, at the outset, I want to 
<clears throat> address the sort of normative gloss. I mean, there, there seems to be this sort of suggestion, at least implicit, uh, when you read certainly articles by Rosen uh, or, or, or Adam Liptak's, I think, more even handed when he writes about this at the New York Times, that, that there may be something wrong or pernicious about uh, the Supreme Court being pro-business. Um, I would argue that, that if what you mean by pro-business is, well, we're entrenching big businesses rather than the small businesses that, that Karen's going to talk about, sure, that's a problem. Or if you're entrenching incumbents or reducing competition, creating barriers to entry, the sorts of things that are uh, derided as crony capitalism, I would think that's a, a, a problem. Um, but, but looking at it more telescopically and looking sort of the long run history from Roman law through to the common law, I mean, courts traditionally and sort of trying to divine the law and the old common law courts uh, really were interested in trying to facilitate commercial transactions that are beneficial broadly for society. And I think that that's something that ought to really inform the way the courts are uh, approaching cases. Now, granted, most of the, the cases they're talking about here are interpretive, and they're interpretive of the Constitution or interpretive of statutes or assessing regulations. And it's really probably only in that administrative law regulatory context because there's no federal common law where the courts are doing, the Supreme Court of the United States is doing that type of analysis. Uh, but, but I think in general, uh, I mean, it, it was the husband of the, the current Democratic nominee for, for president when he was running for president in 1992 who said, it's the economy, stupid. And I think that the notion that we should uh, be agitated at, the, at a basic level about a pro-business oriented court is, is misguided. I mean, in fact, what we've seen over the last 45 years is a slowdown in productivity growth relative to what we saw before. Um, that's not just in the United States, it's really across the developed world. Uh, Tyler Cowen may be right that uh, we sort of had a one-time productivity bump from, from human capital improvements. It may not be possible to completely replicate that, uh, but it certainly has significant effects on the, the, the public. And I think we're seeing that uh, in, in, on, in both political parties and more broadly in terms of, of our politics now. Um, the Supreme Court is, is an interpretive body. It's not the legislative body. It's not the executive branch. But we certainly, I don't think, would want the Supreme Court normatively to exacerbate these sorts of trends. Um, and particularly over the last 15 years, 15, 16 years, uh, We've seen anemic growth with ups and downs in the economy. We've seen a very weak recession. Um, and we've seen uh, in the, some of the areas I look at uh, you know, significant warning signs. So since 1996, we've seen roughly a halving of the number of publicly traded companies in the United States. Uh, and from 1980 to 2000, on average, we saw 311 firms uh, going public with initial public offerings every year. And in the following decade, uh, that fell to 99 firms. It's ticked up a little bit recently, but still not to the prior average. And so these are, these are things that are, that are really concerning to me as I'm thinking about it. And granted, I'm not saying this is due to the Supreme Court, but, but I think it's an important context when we're talking about these issues more broadly. Talking about what it means when we say pro-business, following up on what Professor Adler was talking about, Adam Liptak, uh, the Supreme Court reporter for the New York Times, who I'm, is, uh, I'm friendly with and I think is, does a very good job in general, has written a number of articles sort of talking about some of this scholarship and some of the, the advocacy suggesting the Roberts Court is very pro-business. In 2013, he wrote, quote, the business docket reflects something truly distinctive about the court led by Chief Justice John G. Roberts, Jr. While the current court's decisions overall are only slightly more conservative than those from the courts led by Chief Justices Warren Berger and William Winkrist, according to political scientists who study the court, its business rulings are another matter. They have been, a new study finds, far friendlier to business than those of any court since at least World War II. Um, the study he was talking about there was one by Lee Epstein and Landis and Posner in the Michigan, Minnesota Law Review, How Business Fares at the Supreme Court. And basically what they did was tally up all the, the titles of the, the names of the cases at the court and pick out the ones that had a business name in the title and see who won or lost. Well, Professor Adler sort of talked about some of the reasons why this is a problematic 
uh, methodology. Uh, saying that, they, they determined that Chief Justice Roberts and, and Justice Alito are uh, the most pro-business justices to serve on the court in 65 years. I am I'm not at all confident that that's the case um, with, with some caveats that I'll get into. So I don't think you can just count the cases uh, and, and say the court's voting for business interests, uh, and that means it's more pro-business. Uh, first, it's important to understand not all cases are alike, and, and Professor Adler talked about this in the Massachusetts v. EPA context, but some cases that the court has decided uh, do have a, a very broad application to business. Um, for instance, uh, Bell Atlantic v. Twombly, 2007, and Ashcroft v. Iqbal, which uh, Professor Adler mentioned in 2009, talking about pleading standards and civil procedure, extremely important across the broad run of cases. And so this would be, I think, a, although one of the cases wasn't a business case, a significant shift uh, that, that has major implications for business across the board. Um, other cases, though, are a lot more mundane uh, and don't have nearly the impact. So you're, you're comparing apples to oranges. It's sort of like if I'm analyzing the stock market and, and I'm comparing Apple and a small cap stock on the Russell 3000 and, and trying to just average those and say, oh, well, what happens with this company is the same what happens with that company. Well, not if you're the average diversified investor and not if you're the average business do all these cases mean the same thing as something like Twomby and Iqbal. And in fact, what we find is uh, that the court in a lot of these cases is not expanding doctrine or, or rejecting efforts to try to, to uh, do things that might be a more pro-business uh, direction. So just a couple years ago, uh, in securities law context, Halliburton v. Erica P. John Fund, this came up to the court more than one time, but the Supreme Court considered whether they wanted to overrule a, a 20-year-old precedent, Basic v. Levinson. Um, is it 20-year-old? Yeah, I think so. A little bit, something like that. Maybe thirty. Uh, but but uh, and 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 eliminate the fraud on the market uh, securities class action line of of, of litigation. Um, they didn't do that. Well, what's the reality now? Ninety four percent of all mergers in the United States trigger a class action securities lawsuit in response. This is a big deal. The Supreme Court, while business may have technically won that case didn't really win that case. The doctrine didn't change, but uh, Wyeth v. Levine, 2009, which Professor Adler alluded to, this was the case on, on preemption of uh, pharmaceutical failure to warn claims in, in state uh, court law. Um, a year earlier, as he'd mentioned in Regal v. Medtronic, the court said, well, there's preemption in the medical device doctrine, looking at the specifics of the 1976 law, did not apply that more broadly to pharmaceutical uh, types of, of, of litigation on failure to warn. And what does that mean? Uh, you had a product with a label that had been extensively reviewed by the FDA for three decades, and a state court tort claim or product liability claim founded in a failure to warn theory uh, was, was going to survive and effectively override the FDA's uh, federal decision on that. You know, that case would have had a major impact on mass tort litigation if it had gone the other way. Uh, there were 70 federal product liability uh, multi-district litigation actions at the end of last year. More than 88,000 separate cases have gone through federal MDL. This would have been a massive shift. The court didn't do it. So, so I think it's important to really look at the types of cases we're talking about and the direction of doctrine, as, as Professor Adler talked about in the environmental context. Uh, you know, I, I do a lot of work with civil litigation. If you're talking about tort liability and you saw a, a, a state Supreme Court, you know, this, the, the federal Supreme Court doesn't do this anymore, but the state Supreme Court trying to interpret the doctrine and they, they clawed back a little bit on uh, product liability cases, it would be absurd to say that that court was more conservative than a court interpreting tort and product liability law but before Greenman v. Uber Power or before William Prosser got a hold of the second restatement of torts in the 60s and created the modern failure to warn line of cases. It'd just be absurd to make that claim. So to go back 65 years and say, this is, yeah, I, I think it's, we've got to be very careful about what we're talking about here. Uh, thirdly, lower courts matter here. Um, I, I, Professor Adler talked a lot about sort of the, the cert petition and the cert docket, but if certain lower courts are issuing rulings that are aggressively pushing the envelope on avenues for litigation, expanding the regulatory authority or the like, the Supreme Court saying no is just really keeping the status quo ante in place. Um, 
there is definitely a greater propensity than in the past to grant cert on business-oriented cases. Uh, we've seen more of that. that, that it's, it's relatively easy to establish. Um, it may be a function of different interests and experiences of the justices on the court, but it also may be a function of lower court trends. It's important to keep that in mind. And uh, as, as Professor Adler talked about, and as I've suggested, whether business wins or loses a particular case doesn't answer the clear question about uh, whether the doctrine itself uh, is pro or anti-business. It's very complicated often, and it's important to, to, to step back and look at this, because as he talked about with Justice Scalia in the criminal law context, it's, it's also true in, in cases involving business. So originalism is a dominant methodology on the quote-unquote conservative uh, justices on the court, and one might think because it, the original Constitution wanted to limit federal power, that makes this a more pro-business ideology, but that's not necessarily true. Justice Thomas, for instance, has held that the longstanding dormant commerce clause is, is basically nonsense and, and that states can therefore effectively restrain commerce unless Congress expressly says otherwise, uh, unless they're doing overt tariffs or something like that. Um, Justice Thomas similarly doesn't believe in implied preemption at all uh, in a lot of contexts that would, would permit something like uh, Wyeth v. Levine, where uh, sort of shakedown lawsuits could be permitted at, at, at states where there are uh, plaintiff's bars to capture the, the state legislature or the courts. Um, the, the cases, the 96 and 2003 cases that Professor Adler alluded to during the Rehnquist Court uh, on punitive damages, BMW v. Gore and State Farm v. Campbell, you know, that found a substantive due process constitutional right uh, to excessive state law punitive damages, arguably more sweepingly pro-business than anything we've seen in the Roberts Court. Uh, and who was in the majority on that? Justices Breyer, Souter, Stevens. Who was dissenting? Justices Thomas and Scalia. So, so your interpretive doctrines may lead you in a certain direction, and it may be pro-business in one case and not in another, and it's important to keep that in mind, and that also applies to statutory construction. So uh, a case Professor Adler is well, well aware of, King v. Burwell, the statutory interpretation of, of, of the Obamacare statute. It probably wasn't business-friendly to read uh, state as federal in that statute, although I have friends who might disagree with me on that. Um, but there are even hints there of the Chief Justice's continuing skepticism of, of full Chevron deference uh, to administrative interpretation. And there's plenty of other cases where you sort of have loosey goosey statutory interpretation types of questions concerning honest services fraud or, or whether a fish caught offshore is an item analogous to documents being shredded by Arthur Anderson in the wake of Enron. Uh, and, and these sorts of cases, the more loosey goosey statutory analyses are arguably pro-business. So, and they're not pushed by the more conservative types of justices. Um, and I also finally just want to say it's important, you can't think of just side A and side B. People want to focus on Roberts and Alito and, and these sorts of analyses, but uh, are they more pro-business than Rehnquist and O'Connor? I think it's hard to say, maybe, maybe. Um, uh, conversely, I think you could argue Sotomayor and Kagan are, are less pro-business than Souter and Stevens, who were sort of moderate Republican appointees who may have shifted to the left on, on some of the constitutional law hot button cases, but as the punitive damages case would suggest, uh, certainly weren't in, in a lot of the business oriented cases. So. Um, just a few major developments. You're going to get a whole panel on this next, but uh, we've seen Twombly and Iqbal, which I talked about with pleading standards, very important. Class certification, you'll hear about in the next panel, but Walmart v. Dukes uh, and Comcast v. Barron um, significantly uh, raised the bar. Now, whether this is just sort of an outer bound case or not is is is... Uh, worth discussing. I don't think it's nearly as significant as, as Iqbal and Twombly for business broadly, but, but but there's at least an outer bound on class certification there. Securities class actions, basically the status quo. Stone Ridge didn't expand securities li liability for aiding and abetting liability. Halliburton didn't get rid of fraud on the market theory. Uh, preemption, uh, on the one hand, on the other hand, we talked about that with Medtronic and, and Wyeth v. Levine. Arbitration, another big one, at least for big businesses, AT&T Mobility v. Concepcion, 2011, American Express v. Italian Colors, 2013. Uh, we already see regulatory pushback on this in the financial services context uh, with 
a proposed rule at the CFPB. I, I submitted a comment opposing that rule, but uh, uh, certainly for certain classes of business, arbitration uh, is, is something where the court, having interpreted the Federal Arbitration Act from the 1920s as, as uh, allowing uh, arbitration clauses that that uh, uh, foreclose class action remedies are under most contexts enforceable. And uh, finally, government, be regulatory, government regulatory power. We, we heard about Massachusetts EPA. Obviously, you know about NFIB v. Sebelius. Um, these, these aren't pro-business decisions. Uh, you do see some other movement in the other direction. Sarbanes-Oxley, Free Enterprise Fund v. Uh, Public Co Company Accounting Oversight Board in 2010. So it's not as if regulators are, are, are winning all these cases. But you do see some pretty expansive readings uh, of, of regulatory and congressional power. And finally, I need to turn this over, but I just want to ask sort of the, the, the final question, does this matter? And of course it matters on, on one level, but, but I tend to believe that the Supreme Court, because law schools train people to read cases, and that's the way law schools function, I think that scholars and people that follow this thing put far too much influence on the Supreme Court, where a lot of the action doesn't ever come to the court. One of the things I look at are, are federal criminal enforcement and civil enforcements against big businesses. This is how it's done. Courts don't see it. You have deferred and non-prosecution agreements. Essentially, they, they were unknown before 1992, essentially uh, very rare for the first decade of their existence, more than 300 in the last decade. 16 out of the Fortune 100 companies have, a have had in the last five years a Justice Department overseer reporting to the Justice Department that the, that the company has to listen to inside the business, billions of dollars of fines, changes in management, changes in marketing, changes in sales practice, changes in compensation, all ordered under the threat of criminal prosecution by the Justice Department, none substantively reviewed by any federal judge. And you see some of the same things with dovetailed criminal enforcement, more than $75 billion in civil remedies uh, from just a handful of big banks following the, the financial crisis with billions of dollars of effective appropriation uh, outside of Congress where these businesses are being forced to give to community activist groups uh, and the like that are favorable to the administration. So this is big stuff. Courts don't see it. It's settled. And I think when you're talking about the overall business climate and the law, uh, we need to think about those things, not just what's the, the, the headline cases at the Supreme Court. Thank you. I have pictures. I'm sure I know how to use this. We're waiting for my slides to come up. My name is Mitch Pickerel. Um, I want to first also begin by thanking Jonathan Adler, the Center for Business Law and Regulation at the Law School, for inviting me here uh, to talk a little um, more political science and 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 do the things that both Jonathan and Jim just said we shouldn't be doing. Um, so. Um, uh, my research doesn't focus on on business law in a doctrinal um, sense. Coincidentally, however, I, I, I when I practiced law before go, becoming a political scientist, um, uh, I did do mostly corporate and commercial law. Um, and so I appreciate the doctrine and I appreciate the comments um, very much. And, and unlike some of my political science colleagues, I, I do think doctrine matters and that's that you have to dig into the weeds to fully appreciate what the court's doing in any um, area. However, as a political scientist, I also think it's important to understand trends. The court's agenda changes, um, court's doctrines change, and they change for a reason. And we wanna understand why and explain why. Um, and so I think you need to do both. Um, and so I'm here to present the other side. Um, and uh, we'll take that as it as it may be. I have a chapter in in the Adler book, uh, and so I'm going to update a little bit of what I did. The data in there ended in uh, in uh, the 2012 term. I've got uh, the data analyzed uh, through uh, the last term of the court through 2016 uh, to share. Um, and I'm going to do something a little new, and also um, that I didn't do in that chapter, and discuss. 
the current state of the court and how it's related to an era of uh, what we call polarization. At this point, what I'm working on, I have my co-author uh, Cornell Clayton listed on the title slide because we're working on a book project that examines uh, the Supreme Court over time and its relationship uh, to political regimes or, or, or changes in, in partisan coalitions and what, what's going on in politics. And I'll explain a little bit of that in a minute. Um, so um, first, how to analyze, if we wanna look at the court at a macro level, right, and, and understand trends, um, how do we analyze that? And, and Jim just mentioned a study in 2013 um, by Epstein, Landis, and Posner, in which they uh, looked at businesses as uh, 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 parties and did, they, did, the, did the court rule for them or against them. I suppose that's one way to figure out whether it's, it's in favor, ruling in favor of a business or not. It does depend how you, what, what you think the, the, the phrase business, a business-friendly court means, right? Um, I look at it from a different perspective. I, I, my approach is to be a little more issue oriented. Um, and there, there's, a, there's a, a, a reason why, um, um, but, but um, I think uh, in, in many ways then my analysis isn't really is the court like business. Because I think as Jim said, being pro-business could, could be the sort of crony capitalism uh, side of things, right? And it seems to me what we're really talking about if we understand the conservative intellectual movement that influenced um, uh, conservative politics and influenced um, uh, arguments such as, uh, you know, theoretical arguments such as ori originalism in terms of interpretation on the court. Um, I don't know that we're talking about who wins and loses as much as we are in, in, in the context of, of businesses, uh, government regulation of the economy, right? And so um, my approach is gonna be to, to draw the cases from the US Supreme Court database um, that fall into the economic regulation category and the and labor uh, relations categories, um, what they label economic activity and unions in the data set. Now, um, before I jump into that analysis, I'll say, um, uh, you know, I agree with uh, uh, Jonathan and Jen that this macro level analysis has limitations and these simple labels can be problematic. I'm not as concerned with, with whether John Roberts is, 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 um, is pro-business or not. I, I, I'm, in, I'm interested in the institution over time. You do have to uh, uh, look at individual uh, justices' behavior and I've got a, a slide or two that, that do that, but, but that's not my general approach. And I agree with this, with the baseline idea, both made the argument, you know, that some cases are more important than the others. Of course they are. And that's why you have law professors to go in and, and argue those things. Um, so, uh, uh, but, but uh, and, and litigants who care and are affected. Um, but there's, there's two ways to kind of do this macro level data analysis. One is um, uh, uh, a sort of a simple attitudinal approach, right? Uh, which is where we look at whether you vote uh, for regulation or against regulation, for business, against business, for unions, against unions. Um, and in the context of, of the Roberts Court, whether the Roberts Court is more conservative or more pro-business than uh, the Rehnquist Court. I think that denoting uh, or using the Chief Justice as the unit of analysis in the court is, is weird um, uh, and problematic, and I'll explain why. But I'll start with that because that's that's typically, when we're talking about the Roberts Court, we're talking, we're talking about the Roberts Court because uh, Roberts is the Chief Justice. Um, but there's another approach called the regime's approach that I take, and I'm, I'm, in the interest of time, I'll have to avoid going into too much detail. I can answer questions about it. I discuss it in the chapter in the book. Um, but first, let's start then with, um, I think if, if you're gonna say there's something different about the Roberts Court, you have to compare the, the justices on the Roberts Court that replaced the old justices, right? And so what makes the Roberts Court, the Roberts Court now, the first time I did this analysis was just uh, Alito and Roberts, but now we have Sotomayor and Kagan. I put some nice bright colors on there so we can compare Roberts to Rehnquist, Alito to O'Connor, Sotomayor uh, to Souter, Kagan to Stevens. Uh, the broad categories are union activity and economic activity. Most of the, 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 the act, action falls in economic activity. I'll focus on the combined total. You can see that Roberts is only barely um, more conservative or pro-business or anti-regulation, however you want to think of it, than Rehnquist. Alito, a little bit more than, than O'Connor. That's one of the biggest differences. Uh, and Sotomayor and, and, and Kagan actually end up a little more conservative in, in the data than, than Stevens and Souter. And, and Again, we could come up with explanations for that. I think that the docket is 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 part of that. What the kind of cases they're hearing, et cetera. 
Um, you know, but it does suggest some some sort of at least in voting behavior of the of the justices on the court, some moderate shift um, uh, in the the more conservative or or pro business direction. Um, here, then, I look at the outcomes. Um, as I say, I, I'm mostly interested in the court as an institution. What, what, how does it change over time? Um, and here, if we just compare, again, by chief justice, which is kind of the conventional way we, 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 we conceptualize the court in historical periods, uh, you can see uh, the Warren Court was down to 27%, um, anti-regulation, pro-business, however we want to uh, think about it. Burger Court jumps up, Rehnquist Court a, a small bump, and then the, the, the biggest bump in the modern era is to the Roberts Court. So there does seem to be something there, again, at this, very, at this broader macro level with respect to economic activity cases that would warrant some broad conclusion that, uh, yes, the Roberts Court has moved in the, in the, in that direct, in the direction that it's been accused of. Um, uh, here, I just look at the proportion of, of the court agenda. I also think this can be misleading, I agree. Um, but um, uh, the argument is the Roberts Court's more attentive to these issues. Um, and uh, initially, uh, there was some commentary that the Roberts Court was hearing more uh, business-oriented cases. And again, I think it's misleading because there are cases that are not captured here, standing cases, et cetera, that, that may be re relate to business. But this really doesn't show a very big jump overall in the proportion of, of uh, uh, cases that the court's hearing. Um, a bit of a jump back to kind of Warren Court levels um, uh, in the economic activity category, but uh, the cases that are, are characterized as union activity uh, decline a little bit. So that's kind of the very broad overview. That would be the sort of conventional approach um, that political scientists might take. Um, but I want to argue um, that when you think about what's going on in the court, and, and if you can identify trends at these macro levels, you have to kind of think about why that is, right? And there's the old saying, the court follows the election returns. And, and to some degree, there's, there's truth to that. And so um, uh, one approach is to, to think about um, political regimes, right? If we think about uh, history, that we have periods of time in which we have kind of stable, enduring um, institutional arrangements at the federal level. And by that, we mean partisan coalitions, partisan control of institutions. Um, and, and, and even when you have a majority party that's not in control, its agenda dominates. And so, um, uh, and, and this approach has been taken by Stephen Skoranek at Yale to, to really, to, he, he analyzes presidential power. But I think understanding presidents in political time and across regimes is important for understanding the court because they appoint the justices who go on to the court and they have, uh, uh, they have goals, right? Um, they want to get something out of their appointments uh, typically. Um, and so if you think about it, sort of uh, to, you know, the, the New Deal Great Society regime from 1932 to maybe about 1980, uh, the Democratic Party is the, really the majority party, um, a more liberal, uh, progressive uh, 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 government regulation, uh, um, uh, you know, social safety net uh, agenda dominates even when you get a Republican president, Dwight Eisenhower, part of the time with one House of Congress Republicans. Um, he's not able to, to dramatically change the agenda, right? There's, then, then Reagan comes along and, and the agenda changes, and maybe not as much as it changed in 1932, but you get some sort of reconstruction of the, of the regime. Um, and um, um, within a regime, presidents have different uh, levels of power, the theory goes, right? And so reconstructive presidents, FDR or Reagan, um, uh, are, are pushing the regime in a new direction. Presidents... Uh, of the same party later on uh, are articulation presidents. They're advancing the party's uh, agenda. And then you have preemption presidents. And, and I, I'm, I'm pointing this out. I don't, again, I don't want to go too far into the weeds, but I think preemptive presidents and their appointments to the court are really important. And, and I'll, I'll make the case here that, you know, Bill Clinton's appointments um, are, are, are somewhat important um, for understanding the trend the, in, this, in this economic regulation business area. So we might think of uh, Reagan as a reconstructive president, right? And with respect to, to uh, business interests and economics, who uh, is influenced to some degree by law and economics. Um, he's he's at, at the political and policy level arguing for deregulation, lower taxation, et cetera. Um, uh, the Bushes are articulation presidents. Clinton's a preemptive president, right? Democratic president in an era that's much more conservative than certainly, say, the 60s, right? Uh, uh, um, and so Clinton, uh, what a preemptive president has to do is they've got to pick their battles, 
Okay, and Clinton learned this, right? And between 93 and 94, uh, with the 94 midterm elections, um, or, or Dick Morris taught him maybe, but, but um, uh, and so, you know, what a Democratic president in that situation is doing, and you know, Nixon did this as well in 68, is trying to find issues um, uh, uh, that um, they can neutralize. So you're looking, you've been losing elections, and uh, what kind of issues can we neutralize? And arguably, you know, Clinton tries to neutralize law and order, criminal justice. Uh, the, 90, the 1988 election, Dukakis was seen as, you know, the Democrats were viewed as weak on, on crime. They cared about defendants more than victims, et cetera. And, and then, of course, as Jim pointed out, the campaign theme was it's the economy, stupid. Uh, he championed uh, um, uh, NAFTA, free trade, um, and, and attempted to moderate the Democratic uh, Party's position on, on that. Um, and so um, uh, it's important to understand, I had on the last slide, the Supreme Court exists within the political regime. Okay, justices are appointed, um, and and usually, not always, usually sh uh, share the values of the president who, who appoints them. Um, so um, I'm going to skip through these. I have some excerpts from platforms to kind of show how these issues evolve, um, but that would take us too long. And so um, I, I, I try to do more to flesh out um, in, 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 in my you know, research on this to flesh out the connection between the court and developments and regimes. But here I just want to divide the time periods of the court in the analysis in a different way than just using chief justices. I take the first appointment to the court by key presidents in political time across across the regimes from the New Deal regime uh, into the Reagan um, more conservative era. Um, and um, if you look at this then, right, what you see is from uh, uh, Eisenhower to Nixon, uh, it's 27%, we, uh, that, that doesn't change from, and again, I'm not, Warren and Berger aren't chosen for being chief justices, they were the first appointments by those particular presidents. Um, but then you see from Nixon to Reagan, you get a small bump. You continue to get the bump from Reagan's first appointment, O'Connor, um, uh, to, to Clinton's appointment. Um, but you get a big bump from Clinton's appointment uh, to, to Robert's appointment, 54. That's where really one of the uh, <laughs> largest uh, bumps ends up uh, coming, right? Um, and, and then Robert's is 61%. And so my point here is, is that um, it's not this abrupt change from the Rehnquist court to the Roberts court. Uh, the, the, to the extent that, and again, I'm, I, I don't want to overstate conclusions, but to the extent that this kind of macro level analysis does show a more business friendly court or a more anti-government regulation of the economy court, however you want to look at it, it is really part of a long-term trend that has to be understood at some level in terms of of politics and society and, and dominant values. And I think the law and economics movement had a tremendous impact um, on, think, on, on the way uh, political elites and voters think about the, um, uh, or thought about, I, I, I'm, I'm gonna move to and conclude here with, we, I don't know where we are now, but uh, it had a tremendous impact. Um, you saw that in politics and you gradually uh, see that trend occur over time. And so my title of my chapter in the book is the Roberts Court Pro-Business is the Pope Catholic is meant to say, well, if you're following politics and you understand how issues migrate from politics to the court, it's really not that, that surprising um, without making normative judgments about that. I, I wanna create one, I want one quick um, observation though. Um, there's something weird about the regime after 1980. Yeah, it's a more conservative regime, but it doesn't look anything like what Skoranek or political scientists would call previous, would, would call regimes previously, right? Um, because we don't really, the Republicans aren't that dominant of a party. They only have the White House and both houses of Congress for a handful of years during this period of time. The period is really characterized by divided government. Um, and if we go back to 68 and look at even a broader period of time within which this, this conservative era exists, what we see is um, uh, a split party or divided government most of the time. Um, Republicans have had the advantage of appointing most of the, the um, justices to the courts. Current court is obviously split. Um, and it really reflects the current state of politics, a, a divided electorate um, and uh, polarization. And so um, this, this does not focus simply on business uh, uh, and, and economics cases. This is overall, the, the figure on the left is um, 
uh, a score of ideological voting by party opponent, okay, and, or by, by the party appointment. And so the red line are Republican appointees, the blue line is Democratic appointees, the baseline zero there, above that is cons justices voting in the conservative direction in all cases and below in the liberal direction. And you can look at the average um, uh, vote, the average Democratic vote, it's Republican vote, uh, really becomes more polarized over time, much more likely. And so, so it was at one time the, 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 the party, the relationship between the partisan appointment, the party who appointed the justice and ideological voting was not nearly as strong as it is today. On the right here, the, is essentially the trend up shows uh, the correlation between um, uh, party appointment in, and um, voting, and the gray line shows 5-4 cases. So we're, the, when, when we have 5-4 cases, the split is not just ideological today, it's partisan. And I think we all know that, right? This is the data ends here in 2014 before we lost Scalia. So lastly, I took out, again, those union and economic cases, and I just pulled out 5-4 decisions. Okay, to look at this over time, and um, and you can see there's I mean there's there's it, you know Berger and Rehnquist court, two thirds of the cases are uh, five four decisions are um, uh, are in the conservative direction. For the Roberts court, eighty six percent. We have a smaller end, um, but uh, um, and most of those cases are are split along party and ideological lines, and so. Um, uh, the broader picture here is I think that the, the, the court uh, in these cases does reflect at some general level uh, broader political values and political trends, um, uh, but I, I limit my conclusions to that so I'm not accused of overstating them. Uh, thank you. So hi, I'm Karen Harned, and I um, am executive director of NFIB, National Federation of Independent Business, our small business legal center. So we um, are relatively new to um, the Supreme Court in that um, the legal center was founded in 2000 and really started getting active, I'd say, in around 2004. Um, but now I would say we're pretty active, and we are um, what Jonathan would call a repeat player. Um, so. What I'd like to question and then also discuss is a lot of times when people talk about whether or not the court is pro-business is, you know, what Jim led with, which is the crony capitalism and the big business issues. And um, those really are what I would say, you know, a lot of the big business cases, honestly, are the cases that are gonna get up there. I represent the small business owners, particularly we focus on those that have 10 employees or less. So I'm talking about your local dry cleaner, your hairdresser, your nail salon, your restaurateur. And um, that's really where we come at these cases from. So a lot of the issues that Jim discussed, especially when you talk about mass torts and things like that, are not really where you see our focus. We see business um, issues differently what are business issues at the court differently, probably more expansively than what is currently considered by those on the right or the left. And by that, I mean, for us, one of the big issues is property rights. Um, for small business owners, uh, we've done research on this. Property is one of their biggest assets. In fact, um, research we did several years ago showed that most small business owners own more than one property. Um, uh, and that is a big asset for them that they leverage to get cash flow or that they develop their business on, you, you know, use for business, that sort of thing. And so we've been very active in these cases. And, um, um, what's been interesting is to see, though, that the big businesses have taken uh, much more of an interest in these cases, I would say, as of late. Um, this, the most uh, famous case, uh, really, in 2005 was, um, I think, before Roberts got to court, the Kelo decision on eminent domain, where the big, the larger business community um, is at least split and maybe even in favor sometimes of eminent domain. Whereas for my constituency, that would be an example of an issue where we are completely um, 
you know, all in for the property owner, right? And and very much oppose um, the use of eminent domain. But then when you move forward into more of the Roberts Court's property rights decisions, we are seeing actually a really good trend there as far as um, them acknowledging um, that yes, uh, the Constitution means what it says, that you get compensated if the government um, takes part of your land for any reason. And you've got the cases like um, uh, the Kuntz decision and the Arkansas Game and Fish decision were really important decisions in this. Uh, Kuntz on, you know, um, the issue of, um, you know, uh, 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 taking the property and being compensated and Arkansas, or I'm sorry, Arkansas Game and Fish on that, and then Coons on what conditions the government puts on a property um, owner. Um, in that case, the government was saying that the property owner could only develop his land if, um, first of all, he set part of it aside for conservation and then also paid for land my, several miles away to be um, to, you know, conserved, um, which had absolutely nothing to do with his particular project. And the court recognized that for what it was extortion and said no. And so those have been two really good cases. And I would say that the chamber, not just NFIB, filed in both of those cases. Um, and then you've got Horn, which was last term's case, where you had the raisin farmer out of California, a raisin grower out of California, and um, they had a set-aside program for amount of raisins he had to um, give to the government for them to sell. And um, the court um, said that that was a takings. And um, the big issue in that case, though, was the court said, look, property is property, whether it's real or personal, um, it's a taking if the government takes it. And I've seen subsequent articles um, that have sh said that this is even going to have an instant, you know, impact in the intellectual property context, which is obviously a big issue for the big, bus the bigger businesses um, in our country. So that's a been a big focus of our work, and that is an area of the law that we would definitely say is a business issue because it's important to the small business owners we represent. Um, we also have done a lot in the employment law space, and this is an area where really it hasn't been all that great for um, the business community. And I would say the large and the small businesses would be in agreement on that. If you look at the court itself, you only have one justice, Justice Thomas, that even has any experience in this area of the law. He used to be, um, you know, an EEOC commissioner. So he actually saw this boots on the ground. I would say the other justices, they really... Um, I, I don't know whether or not they're interested in it. I know they respond, it appears they respond uh, very viscerally to how the case comes up and what the facts are. And um, that whole old adage, bad facts make bad law, um, seems to crop up a lot in the employment law um, uh, area. Um, the justices really um, are going to find a way to find for the employee, I think, in many instances. Um, if you can set it up as one of clear statutory interpretation, um, if in fact it is, which actually many of these cases are, you do see um, them being more willing to um, fine for uh, the employer community. Um, but these are not in many, some of them are 5-4, definitely. But a lot of them are 6-3 and 6-3 against um, the employers. And when we look at these cases in, in the small business community, you know, uh, our concern is what does this mean long-term for people being able to file frivolous lawsuits against our members, because that's really where we have seen such a dramatic growth in the lawsuits that small business owners are facing. It really is in the, employ is in the employment law space. It's not class actions, but it's the disgruntled employee, the employee that got fired, that's going to try to check any box he or she can, whether or not it's warranted, and getting past that motion for summary judgment, because otherwise, or, or yeah, dis dismissing the case out of hand, because otherwise, Otherwise, the small business owner isn't going to go to court. Again, we're not the ones that are able to fund efforts to go all the way to the Supreme Court as individual businesses. Um, they're, they're just going to cut the check. And so these are really becoming more of nuisance suits and cons, uh, you know, uh, cost of doing business suits for them. Um, and what we have seen in all these cases is really what, uh, in, or in the employment law area cases, is... Um, 
the court is pretty uh, solid, I would say, or had been prior to Scalia, we'll see going forward on um, being pretty true to statutory interpretation in most instances. If it means that they're gonna go super narrow, they're gonna go super narrow, um, which is good and bad, good in that you may not get an outlight outright loss, but bad in that you may not get the clarity that you were looking for as a business litigant going in because in the employment law space in particular, the reason these cases are so important to all of us are because of the circuit split before below, because it is just, you know, crazy out there as far as everybody's on different, you know, singing from different playbooks. And we want to at least know what the rule is. We'd like a We'd like a rule that's under, um, easily, easy to implement. And those are things that is very hard to get out of this court, if I'm being um, completely candid. Um, there, um, I would say on the, uh, on the union issues, that is an area in employment space uh, where the court has been more um, willing to um, really um, side with the um, uh, management or employer community over the unions. And I think that is an example, as Jonathan had alluded to, to um, the strategic um, uh, focus that the litigants that are bringing these cases are taking um, when they're taking them up to the court. I really think there has been, and this is actually also true in the property rights area. I think the reasons that you've seen the court rule more in favor of you know small business, those um, uh, and and employers and these issues is because of the cases that the court is taking and the cases that people are teeing up and the cases people are choosing not to tee up to the Supreme Court. And um, so for that reason, I think um, that is a large part of why those cases have turned out more um, positively for the employer community, the small business community. Um, Generally, again, on statutory interpretation, uh, the small business community I represent, this is a, a big issue for them. And they're very much in the category of less is more than enough when it comes to government regulation. And all we're all about keeping each branch in its own lane. And um, the court is typically pretty good in this. You know, I always say it was a case we won, but then ultimately lost in policy. But to me, it was how the process was supposed to to work. And that was the Lily Ledbetter case, Ledbetter versus Goodyear. Um, she um, was, it was a pay equity type of case. And, um, and the bottom line was the court looked at it based on the statute. It was a statutory of limitations case. Yes, 180 days means 180 days. That's what the statute says. You know, sorry, Ms. Ledbetter, it is sad, your story, but you were out of time on filing your lawsuit. Um, well, I will never forget that day because as we were celebrating the victory in the Supreme Court, I went up to the lobbyists at NFIB and I said, well, now it's your turn because I knew and true to form, Senator Kennedy immediately introduced legislation to change the statute. Um, and they did. And um, that is how the process is supposed to work. And that, you know, even when you um, lose that way, at least you're losing the way that that the uh, the government's supposed to work. And that's, that's a big issue for the small business community because we aren't um, the people that are running, we're walking the halls of the different agencies. We just don't have that capability for small business. Our big issues um, more on a macro level are due process and notice and anything procedurally, again, to keep the different branches of government in their lanes, in their proper lanes. And for the most part, I would say the Roberts Court is pretty good at that. I would make one notable exception, and of course it was our biggest and most famous failure, which was NFIB versus Sebelius. Um, but I now put that in the um, Affordable Care Act exemption to the Constitution. Um, I just think that's where we are. King and Burle Burwell solidified that for me. Um, and, and to administrative law, I would say, King and Burwell. That, yeah, there's just a special world for the ACA at the Supreme Court. Um, but as Jonathan mentioned, you know, another one on that is uh, UARG, uh, the, uh, the uh, a greenhouse gas case that the court heard several terms ago where 
Jonathan said it was both a win and a loss for the small business or for the business community. Well, we were the winners from the business community because it directly dealt with um, this exemption that they were creating for small business. And the um, court said, no, EPA, you cannot re rewrite a statute. You can't change a threshold from whatever it was, 1,000 to 100. Um, which is literally what they did is took white out to a statute. And we were the ones that won the be the biggest on that one because we effectively were not going to be regulated as a result of that win. Um, this, But I think, you know, again, generally on statutory interpretation, if that's your key issue going up uh, um, as any litigant, um, you've got a better shot there at the court in most instances, I would say, unless the facts are just horrid. Um, and by horrid, I mean sympath very sympathetic for the person that you're fighting um, in the in the matter. Um, Chevron deference has been a, a very, very strong focus for us. Um, again, because of what I said, it's all about process. It's all about uh, notice and comment. It's all about giving the small business owner a fair opportunity to know what the law is and not have um, agencies get to just run wild and do whatever they want with no notice. And that is what's so interesting um, about the Roberts Court is I think it's been very clear that the Chief Justice gets the joke on what the agencies have been doing. I mean, they've been pushing it and pushing the envelope and pushing the envelope to give themselves more and more power, which is probably natural, but something we find offensive and, and not helpful um, and really has called them out on it, called them out of it, on it, most notably in the city of Arlington case. But, you know, when you're looking at the vacancy of Justice Scalia, what does that mean for Chevron deference? Well, actually, he was one of, he was on the other side in the city of Arlington. Um, and so it's really going to be interesting whoever fills his shoes. And if you and when we look at Chevron deference cases and the kinds of cases that are most attractive to bring to the court, um, really where you see them, um, and it's not even necessarily five four. I mean, often we'll get um, Justice Breyer, for example, is when you've got just it's just blatant, you know, due process, no due process for you know the little guy, uh, for the regulated entity, um, or um, you know the agency. Uh, this was an employment law case of last term, Encino Motors, uh, dealing with a, an exemption from overtime. The agency, for literally decades, had one policy, and then all of a sudden just changed it and didn't, you know, just changed it by interpretation. Um, you know when you're able to make the case, look, justices, we have been relying as an industry on this for decades, and now all of a sudden it's gone. This is uprooting our whole business model. That's when you're able to get um, more of the justices to agree with you that the agency has overstepped. And so those um, are two really good examples of that. And then the null canning also would, would I think, fall into just um, uh, you know, on that one, it was unanimous against um, uh, the government when they were trying to recess a point or, or tell the Senate when they were in recess for appointing um, NLRB um, uh, member members to the National Labor Relations Board. Um, finally, a little bit about um, what Jonathan mentioned as far as the cert process. I think, again, and I guess this has really come out in everybody's comments, it's how you, you know, how you um, shape the field, right? How you um, set set the table for the court term. And we are very, have become very aggressive, as have a lot of our colleagues on uh, the, in the cert process and um, trying to get court, the court to take certain cases, not um, not lobbying against them, taking others, just not weighing in. And that process has, uh, is is increasingly sophisticated, as Jonathan alluded to. Um, everything from, you know, obviously filing the petition for cert to making sure, you know, lobbying SCOTUS blog that follows, you know, the Supreme Court. Can you get on petition of the day? Oh, that's a good sign. We might have a shot, you know. Um, even VOLA conspiracy, um, you know, making sure you're creating a buzz about the case because, you know, the clerks look at it. I Honestly, I think a lot of that's peripheral. It's more important what's in the brief and and that sort of thing, obviously, on the petition and whether or not you have a circuit split. But those, you know, that is the level of um, uh, involvement people have at the cert process, right? And um, I, I've just seen that um, 
dramatically increase in my 14 years um, doing this. Um, people really spent a lot more time at the cert stage than they ever did before, at least, at least from what I have witnessed. Um, even in that, on, on that also, I've even seen, um, we don't really do this, but I have seen a lot of focus on what's the SG gonna say? Are they gonna say, take the case? Because if they say they take the case, you're gonna have a lot better shot of getting the case up there. So there, this, there is no stone that goes unturned when it comes to you um, trying to get your case before the Supreme Court. Um, I think that is really all I have right now, though I'm happy to take um, questions. But I, I think again, um, for us, it really is more of a mixed bag. Um, when you look at the, if I'm wrapping up my comments, property rights, union issues, those are typically, they've been going pretty well for us. Employment issues, um, I don't know, we're probably on the losing side more than we win. And statutory interpretation is, is pretty good under the Roberts course, but there are no significant notable exceptions. Chevron deference is definitely, let's see what comes next. Um, it is my hope that, um, uh, that, that, the, that the Supreme Court, regardless of who is the next nominee, will um, really give meaningful review to what agencies are doing because the administrative state has become so vast um, and um, really uh, so aggressive in their posture in so many um, of these regulatory matters. So thank you very much for your time and thank you for inviting me. Hi, uh, thanks. This was uh, this was very uh, stimulating. Um, but two, two. I promise their questions, and they're very quick. So one very quick one for Mitch. There was in your data there was this very remarkable dip uh, in voting in conformity with party affiliation, like in the early '90s. And I was just wondering, was that like entirely Harry Blackman or something? So that's, that's question number one. Question number two, you know, you frame this um, as a quantitative sort of empirical question. Can we do these things empirically? You're, in some sense, the, uh, the critics of the empirical argument are saying um, you've, you, you can't do these data because you've, you know, you're, uh, you have to look at the data more carefully. In other words, you can't look at a win for business as a unit co comparable to any other win for business. I agree with you, but I think you've, you've like fundamentally misconceived the question, and it was misconceived for you, admittedly, maybe by people like Rosen and, and Tubin and so on. But I think the real question is not that the court is becoming more pro-business or cares more about business or whatever. I think the court does have um, a changing ideological um, trend, but it's a trend towards um, a, you know, a principled theoretical approach to government and society. Um, that does happen coincidentally to um, favor business sometimes. Um, but by looking at it as business, of course, you come up with data that are confusing. So I think the ideological change is the court wants to make private power uh, either something we don't believe exists or something that's conceived as inappropriate for public policy consideration. Um, and that does become a normative question. And I think, you know, ironically, it is an issue that isn't specifically addressed in our constitution or in any particular statute that says court favor private freedom or whatever. And therefore it's an appropriate issue for political action, but not judicial activism. And I think that's an appropriate criticism of the court. I mean, I have to look back at the data to explain that exactly. Harry Black and some of it, some of that is, is the nine is, is also goes into the mid nineties with the appointment of Ginsburg and Breyer and, and their early voting record was not strongly ideological either. Um, but I'd have to look back for what's occurring slight right before that. We, have, we might actually agree on the descriptive account and up north. And I, I try to do my remarks here, do in this panel talk more kind of the set up in terms of how we ask the question more than what the answers are. I think I think when you actually look at, okay, where is the court more likely to be quote unquote pro-business and where it isn't, I think that 
you rate which has been doing the work, or other doctrinal commitments, which um, are particularly favorable to business in certain types of contexts, and more mixed than others. And, and I don't know if I formulated quite, quite the same way, but for example, um, uh, the court, as, as we've known it over the last 10 years, is very skeptical of the judiciary as a uh, institution that should uh, be where certain types of, of broader questions of socioeconomic policy should be resolved, and very skeptical that the court should decide what gets heard in court. Um, that is to say, narrow view of standing, very narrow view of implied causes of action, very narrow view of what you can do over it. Congress is going to put something in the, in the court, the court will follow that, but you know, even had opinions where they've said, we're no longer in the business of, of opening the doors for litigation. Um, that clearly makes it much harder for plaintiff's attorneys because what happens is, is when the court kind of clarifies what the rules are about certain types of litigation, over time businesses figure out, okay, what can we do to protect ourselves from the types of litigation that have been approved? Arbitration clause is a good example of that. Once it becomes clear that the court will enforce the Federal Arbitration Act in, in a way that's, that's highly preemptive, businesses realize, okay, well, we need to have arbitration clauses. And then when a when plaintiff's attorney comes and looks and well, here's a theory about how we might get around that, the court's response is, go to Congress. And given the Congress is, that's hard to do. In the land better context, plaintiff's attorneys were successful. In the arbitration context, when you find right of action under um, a or a better liability under 10b-5, uh, uh, folks haven't been, been uh, done. So, so I, I, I agree that there is there is a doctrinal commitment that in particular contexts um, does manifest itself in a pro-business way. Um, but it's not a blanket pro-business orientation. It's, it's a view of the role of the court, um, who should be authorizing types of litigation, what we think of entrepreneurial plan of litigation, things like that. Um, and then where I think it gets, gets really interesting is that there are some areas like do regulatory process, like preemption, and so on, where um, it, the doctrinal commitments don't clearly cut, or don't cut, cut as clearly in a pro anti business way. And, and that, I think, highlights the point that we have to think of being more why is it that the court finds preemption in some cases and not in others? Um, I think Kurt here has written some about understanding why that is. A chapter in the book by her colleague, uh, Rick Hills, that has a theory about that. Um, but to understand those cases, I think we have to, we have to get beyond these labels and think of the doctrinal commitments, and then, we can, and then we can say, okay, do we like that doctrinal commitment, either from the standpoint of interpretive methodology or from the standpoint of its practical out results? Um, and, and, um, and we might probably disagree on some of those. But, but I, I think in terms of understanding what's going on, I think we're pretty close to the same. I should have added to an extruder was a pretty good explanation for that period as well. Okay. Um, cool. um. Let me try to ask, formulate a, a more theoretical question because I, I can't get past the first word in this seminar, which is business. Um, so coming from someone who does philosophy of economics, the most obscure field there is at any university. Um, I don't know what, what people here mean by business. I mean, business and economics is just some organization that's involved in providing goods and services. So if you advantage coal miners and disadvantage a plaintiff's law firm, you are neutral on business. That is, you've, you've helped one business and hurt another. And what I hear here is that pro-business or helping business is helping advantage a certain set of businesses and maybe advance a certain set of, of uh, ideological or political concerns like good economics, and w w which is not the same as, as helping a business. I mean, putting AT&T out of the monopoly business seemed to help the, the, the other businesses. And uh, the most important, to, to economists, the most important 20th century tort case by far was Buick versus McPherson. And it put eventually asbestos manufacturers out of business and caused 
arguably drugs to be safer. Maybe, maybe not, but it's not clear in any case what it means to be pro-business or advantage business or by helping coal miners disadvantage wind energy producers and by being in favor of judicial deference, which is another ideological commitment that gets thrown in there, whether that's you want to be, you want to defer with uh, the Affordable Care Act, which is actually the formal name here in a law school, not Obamacare, and, and, uh, or whether you want to be uh, attacking it and in terms of deference to the legislature, judicial deference to the legislature. So what I don't get here, I don't, I don't understand here is what we mean by business, not, not even a little. And I'm not trying to be sort of the person, the renegade from the philosophy department across uh, the campus who doesn't understand simple concepts, although that's what we do for a living is fail to understand simple concepts. <laughs> but, but um, <laughs> Uh, I don't understand what business is here, and I don't understand it in, in a big way. Uh, so if somebody could explain it to me, I'll, I'm, I'm going to take notes. Well, I, I mean, I, I think I tried to start with that qualification at the outset, that, that you know, what do you mean when you say pro-business to begin with? And I do think it's uh, sometimes complicated, and I think therefore, uh, I think it complicates some of the questions that the, the, the empiricists ask here. Uh, I mean, I think it's a shorthand it's a simple shorthand uh, for w when the empiricists are asking, and it's like, well, does the does the corporation win, or the company win, or the employer win, or does the employee win, or the plaintiff's law firm win, or the labor union win, or what have you? Um, but uh, again, the win loss doesn't matter so much, and I think it's really trying to facilitate commercial transactions uh, that that uh, is would be the normative spin I would put on what I would like the government writ large to do. Now, now that doesn't necessarily always apply to the court. In fact, when it comes to the U.S. Supreme Court, as I said, other than certain types of cost-benefit analyses that come to play in administrative law review, they're by and large trying to interpret words. So, um, you know, these things are going to only come in on the margin, but they probably do come in on the margin because the cases that get up to the Supreme Court uh, are selected by the Supreme Court, and they're tough cases by definition to some degree. Let me add a little bit. I mean, in my introduction to the book, I actually make this point, right, that we throw this label out pro-business, and so what does that mean? And, and, and you know, so in the, in Jeff Rosen's Supreme Court Inc. story in the New York Times Magazine, which more than any other single, you know, article or whatever else uh, uh, formulated and advanced the narrative of the Roberts Court as pro-business, examples that are given are. Um, cases in which the Chamber of Commerce, the side of the Chamber of Commerce uh, wanted one, um, and the identity of, of parties in the cases. Um, and so one statistic he throws out is in the first seven antitrust cases the Roberts Court hears, the corporate defendant wins. Six of those seven cases, the plaintiff was a corporation as well, and in the, se the seventh one was was Twombly, which is really not an antitrust case; it's really a pleading case in terms of its with its importance. And so, I agree that if we're going to throw around this label, we need to unpack it. And if it were totally up to me, we'd be having a discussion about particular doctrinal questions: how do we interpret statutes? How do we approach what Congress did? How do we um, uh, to follow on the earlier question, how do we think questions of private power should or should not influence the way the court evaluates or applies certain questions? Um, that's not the discussion we have uh, about the court. Right? We have uh, 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 a big article saying Supreme Court Inc. We have magazines publishing articles with pictures of the justices with corporate logos on their on their robes, and we have studies saying uh, by very prominent academics and one sitting judge saying this is the most pro-business course in the last 60 years, even though in many meaningful substantive respects, the law is more hostile to employers, capital, investors, uh, or at least larger investors and so on than it might have been uh, 60 years ago. Um, so, so I agree we have to unpack these terms. Uh, and I think that's you know part of what what we're doing, and I don't think that that. Um, but but the, all that said, when we look at an employment law case, we generally recognize that most employers may have a particular preference for the outcome, and that most employee rights groups and unions are going to prefer another outcome. In Massachusetts versus EPA, it's true that the Aspen Ski Corporation and some alternative energy companies filed briefs on support of the EPA. But 
if you look at the briefs in that case, if you look at where the business community were, was, where the Chamber of Commerce and NFIB and so on and so on, they're all on one side. Uh, and that in a lot of these cases, if we, if even though the term itself is imprecise and, and, and requires some unpacking, we can say that we recognize where the business community, if we think that's a useful characterization of a, of, of, of a force that, that is involved in, in litigation and involved in the political process, generally has a certain preference for outcomes in a, in a, in a wide range of cases. And that there will be cases like some of the energy cases from this past term that split the business community down the middle. But that there are a lot of cases where we can say business tends to line up on one side, labor tends to line up on a particular side, consumer groups tend to line up on a particular side, environmental groups tend to line up on a particular side. And that we can use that as a lens for um, how we think court outcomes affect these interests. And we might think that that's a, a useful way of thinking about whether or not we like the outcomes. Okay, we have time for one, I hope short question, but okay. Very short, because I think, um, Jonathan, you just answered it, but I was gonna say, couldn't one, notwithstanding the philosophic or doctrinal niceties, take as a fairly good proxy, the repeat player chamber NFIB, since they're represented here, and then, look at them as representing business interests. And it's very striking that in some cases where the business community is split, they won't file a brief in that case, et cetera. So at least as a proxy, I mean, because we could deconstruct business, and I think you were getting at this such that it's meaningless, and I don't think we need to go that far. Um, I think it is a useful proxy, but it's also limited. And, and I'd, I'd be curious at Mitch's thought on this as well. So, and let me point out a couple of ways why I think it's limited. One is, um, there being a repeat player does does a couple of things. One is certainly gives them the opportunity to develop, have an agenda for what they want to see the court do and try and, and, try and push that over time. Um, but they're also strategic in other ways. And, and I, don't, I, I don't mean any of this description to be disparaging, but I think it's an idea. So if, if you're the Chamber of Commerce and you're raising money from your members for your litigation effort, you want to convince them that they're supporting your efforts is has value added above the value that a more issue or, or industry specific trade associations involvement might have or more than simply hiring their own folks have. And so what are the things is the Chamber of Commerce you want to point to? Well, one of the things you want to point to is we're having an effect. So the Chamber of Commerce itself has an institutional interest as it increases its involvement in these cases to increase its win-loss record. So what that means is it may file a lot of briefs that it was pretty sure it was gonna win anyway, because that means it can go back to its members and say, look at all the cases we're winning. And it means it's going to be, um, might be reluctant if a case is a sure loser, unless there is some other symbolic value of having raised the flag, there's going to be a reluctance to file a case in in, a, in, in an instance where it's a, where, where it's a true. And there are, um, I'm going to, uh, uh, Kasten versus St. Cobain, I think is an example where I think NFIB was in, I think you guys were in that, but yeah. the chamber was not. And there's no explanation for why the chamber was not other than they really thought it was a loser and they didn't want, they didn't want to spend their money. It was not a case like, like some other, like some of the energy cases where you just have a split among their members, and so that means we we have to be wary about about the number because the number is a product also of the incentives they face in terms of the resources they deploy. The, the one last thing I would say, and you know, the, the, uh, Brad Jundef has a chapter in the book that I think is useful. This is if we're going to look at the chamber as a repeat player. Um, let's compare it to some other repeat players. And, and he, he looks, compares it to the Solicitor General's office um, because he thinks there are reasons why we would expect if the chamber is doing better or worse than, than the Solicitor General's office, um, that would tell us something more meaningful about the chamber's effectiveness as, as a repeat player. But if it's merely replicating a similar win-loss rate, or then um, maybe we, we might not think that the chamber is necessarily having this big impact. Um, and what he finds is that is that um, uh, you know the chamber does 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 well, but it doesn't really exceed the the, the uh, win rate of the Solicitor General's office, at least certainly through the Bush administration and the early Obama administration. I think if you were to update his data, you might find um, uh, some deviation in the last few years, um, uh, and it's certainly be interesting to see going forward. Um, but I so also we say it's it's a useful proxy. But we, we want to be careful with it because there are other we may be finding other things that might 
might swamp the, the effect that we're looking for. So I'm not, I would have two thoughts. One is I always like triangulation, right? Because in social science, our, our data is always problematic. It's never perfect. Never, we, we have a concept, we try to operationalize it, and we try to come up with some way of measuring it. And, and uh, inevitably, it's over-inclusive or under-inclusive. You just hope to code consistently so any errors you have in there are random. Um, and if you have different, uh, if you're operationalizing data in different ways and have different measurements and coming to the same conclusion, then you can be more comfortable. So I, I would think that that would be an interesting way to do it. I think Jonathan raised some caveats. I also would say that you know, literature we have on repeat players, um, that might obscure some of the issues in terms of which business groups are, are we talking about uh, it's important to, especially large corporations versus small businesses. Um, and typically, the number of repeat players you have privilege larger uh, institutions, right, and, and with more resources. So I, I don't know the extent that that would be a problem, especially today. Um, but okay, well, I think that this is a good place to end because I think it suggests how complex a lot of these issues are and, and and should give us some pause before we overgeneralize from from shall we say imperfect data um, and from limited perspectives. Um, I'm sure that there are some other questions, but I think as the first panel, we have some obligation to end more or less on time uh, to keep the program uh, on track. So let me uh, ask you to join me in thanking our panelists for a terrific discussion. Scheduled for a break and to reconvene at 11 o'clock.